Welcome back. So we are talking about physics-informed machine learning, the process of building models from data that are either physical in nature uh, or are discovering new physics or embedding physics into the machine learning process. And today we're talking about stage three, uh, which is designing an architecture. Okay, so this is one of uh, my favorite parts of this entire machine learning uh, pipeline. I've been looking forward to making this video for a while, actually spent a lot of time uh, kind of thinking about the progression. And we're gonna have hours and hours and hours of you know, material and lectures on various architectures that we can look at and use to discover physics using machine learning and to embed physics into machine learning. So super, super interesting, important uh, topic today. And it's one of the kind of most popular areas people think about um, in physics-informed machine learning. So um, this is the neural network zoo. This is um, a figure in um, Nathan Kutz and my book, Data Driven Science and Engineering, inspired by a figure from the Isaac Asimov Institute. Uh, and this just gives a small overview of you know, some of the many, many, many types of neural network architectures you can choose for a particular task um, in machine learning. So, you have things like uh, autoencoder networks, GANs, deep recurrent networks, uh, and many, many more. These are just kind of cartoon sketches of the various ways you can stitch together neural network building blocks uh, into an architecture. And so uh, today we're going to talk about what is it, um, what do I mean by an architecture? What are the different types of architectures? What are ways that these are more or less physical or that there are implicit assumptions built in to our choice of the architecture? And again, this figure, you know, is from five years ago. So this is already, um, you know, just a, a tiny corner of all of the types of architectures that people are playing around with and developing today. Um, a lot of what we're going to talk about in this, uh, this series on architectures is inspired by uh, architectures in the brain, in neuroscience systems. So animals, um, including you know, mammals, humans, um, you know, rodents, um, fish, right? Like insects have nervous systems and brains and the way that they interact with and process data from the real world to make decisions and move their bodies and things like that. Uh, you know, there are a lot of rich architectures in our brains and in our nervous systems. So this is a great figure um, I got from Bing Brunton. Uh, she pointed me towards this. This is a a picture, a, a hand sketch by uh, Cajal, who drew these beautiful um, kind of hand-drawn representations of neuronal architectures as observed in, uh, I believe, microscope imaging. This is a section of the hippocampus, and you can see that this is a pretty complicated architecture. It's multi-scale, there's connections across different regions that are doing different types of computations, uh, and we're you know, just scratching the surface of understanding in neuro science what all of these architectures are, but a lot of that has inspired our uh, neural network and machine learning architectures in the modern era. So a lot of our convolutional neural networks and uh, image processing is inspired by uh, things we observe in the visual cortex. And increasingly we're getting more and more kind of data about these neuronal architectures. And so these two fields are definitely evolving and growing together, uh, both neuroscience and machine learning. So just an important thing to be aware of, we're probably gonna have some videos entirely on kind of neural inspired computing and architectures. Um, so, you know, stay tuned for that later. In this um, you know, part of, of the class on physics and form machine learning, we're going to cover a pretty broad range of different architectures. There are a lot of really important methods out there in literature that researchers are using today, uh, applying neural networks to, and machine learning to physical systems both to discover physics and to make their learning algorithms better by incorporating physics. Uh, so we're going to talk about things like um, ResNet, uh, residual networks, these kind of um, deep uh, recurrent neural networks with jump connections. We're going to talk about um, things like the UNet architecture. This, again, has some implicit uh, inductive bias in just the choice of this architecture kind of assumes that the world it's trying to model is multi-scale in space and time, for example. Uh, 
Uh, we're going to talk about things like operator networks. Um, this is the Fourier neural operator, very, very popular uh, modern architecture to analyze physical systems like partial differential equations. Uh, things like CINDY, the sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. Importantly, this is not a neural network. This is a generalized linear regression to learn a differential equation from data. Okay, and this is an architecture. This is a, you know, a, a, this parameterizes a space of functions you could use to model your system. Um, we're going to talk about pins, physics informed neural networks. Again, huge field of modern uh, physics informed machine learning research. Uh, you know, and, and generally other operator methods and kind of architectures for PDEs and ODEs. And this is, you know, I don't know, maybe half of the topics I'm preparing in each of these we're going to have at least, you know, half an hour or an hour, uh, maybe with code and examples and case studies. Okay, so we're going to go really into depth in a lot of these. I'm pretty sure I have like five hours of material on Cindy alone. Okay, so you can do a deep dive uh, in equation discovery if that's what you're interested in. But today we're talking about architectures and not just, you know, generic architectures, but architectures that are good for physics, that help us actually promote models that are more physical, that help us learn with less data because we've had these implicit biases that, um, that add structure and physics, um, you know, to these machine learning architectures. So I'm going to, you know, talk about this a lot more in you know in the next hours and hours uh, of this the material but i wanted now to start really getting into what do i mean by physics so we're talking about physics and for machine learning and i didn't even des describe what i meant by physics um, i was at um, a neurips workshop uh, about a month ago and i was giving a talk about you know machine learning for scientific discovery and I decided I should probably, you know, Wikipedia, what is the definition of physics before I say that we're doing physics informed machine learning. And, you know, kind of the Wikipedia definition has something to do with matter and energy and change. Uh, and that's fine and good, but I don't like that as a working definition. So I am going to tell you what I mean by physics in the context of what we want our machine learning models uh, to have as kind of their capabilities. So one of the first important pieces we're going to um, highlight is physics historically, the kinds of physics that we um, you know, know and love, like F equals MA, E equals MC squared, things like that, these are somehow interpretable and generalizable. Interpretable in the sense that they're usually very, very simple um, out of you know, all of the, the complicated things I could write down to describe the motion of a falling apple. Uh, F equals MA is a very simple interpretable description. And it's very generalizable because the same physics that describes this apple also describes, you know, the physics of launching a rocket uh, from the Earth to the moon. Okay, so generalizability is a hallmark feature of physics and our understanding of the physical world. And again, I don't think that physics is just limited to matter and energy. I think that there is a physics of how the brain works. And there's a physics for how, you know, a swarm or, you know, a colony of ants behaves. There are these generalizable, interpretable kind of rules that govern complex systems. And we might be able to learn those using machine learning and enforce uh, some of those physics in our machine learning models. Okay, interpretability and generalizability, essential for me to be physical. Um, parsimony and simplicity, these are related, um, but there's this other perspective that we use to promote physicality and models. So there's this great Einstein quote, everything should be made as simple as possible to describe the data, but not simpler. So in the machine learning era, we're looking for models that are as simple as possible to describe the data and no simpler. This principle of simplicity or parsimony has been the gold standard in physics for 2000 years from Aristotle to Einstein. The models that are more beautiful, more parsimonious, as simple as possible and no simpler, typically encapsulate the core bits of physics. And they also have this knock on effect that they're more interpretable because they're simple and they tend to generalize because they're not overfitting. So we're going to talk about this later in the context of the history of science from um, astrology to astronomy, from alchemy to chemistry. Every time we've made this huge kind of leap forward in our understanding of physics, things have actually gotten simpler. The descriptions have gotten simpler and more universal. Okay, 
super important point. And then the last area where um, I think we have a huge opportunity to capture essential physics in machine learning and to discover essential physics with machine learning are these notions of things that are you know, symmetries, invariances, and conservation laws. So almost all of our partial differential equations, mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation, um, you know, all of our partial differential equations come typically from the conservation of some quantity. Okay, mass is conserved, momentum is conserved, energy is conserved. And similarly, there are fundamental invariants in our universe and the way that things work um, that give rise to you know, symmetries in the data. Okay, so symmetries and invariances and conservation laws are fundamental core principles in physics that we can leverage and either bake into machine learning algorithms or learn these symmetries and conservations with machine learning algorithms. Okay, so really, really essential. Um, like we know that you know, if I have a pendulum physics, the physics doesn't change if I translate it, um, you know, in in space. And in principle, this fluid flow shouldn't change if I rotate it. Okay, there are these invariances in the laws of physics. Good. Okay, so that's what I mean by what is physics. Now we're going to go through these architectures and think, how can we either enforce uh, or promote these ideas, and then how can we also discover, you know, symmetries and things like that with, uh, with these architectures. And it's really important. We're talking today about choosing architectures to be more physical, but the same basic principles apply when we add loss functions to train our algorithms, or when we add, you know, when we do a constrained optimization to force our system to adhere to some symmetry or invariance, okay? So this uh, idea of physics is important for architectures, it's important for loss functions, it's important for the optimization algorithm we use to train our machine learning algorithms. Good. And I mean, I guess, you know, the, the takeaway here is yes, we want all of these. If we can, you know, we would love for our machine learning models to be interpretable and generalizable, simple and parsimonious, and actually, you know, enforce or promote the known symmetries, invariances, and conservation of the physical world. Let's not forget, you know, the thousands of years of human experience we have learning physics the old fashioned way. Um, and, you know, let's make sure that we actually bake this into our machine learning models. Good. Okay, so let's just do a really, really simple example. This is kind of what we talked about before in the overview lecture. Let's say I have, you know, a physical system. This is a pendulum in my lab. This is a video. So the representation, the data is, you know, a time series of a very high dimensional vector, which was this re image reshaped into, you know, all of its pixels. So this is maybe a megapixel image evolving in time, and I can represent that either as a matrix or as a really tall vector if I just stack all of the pixels on top of each other. Okay, so it's data, it's data, it's high dimensional data. But we know that this system has low dimensional meaning, right? If I look at this as a human, I don't see a million things I need to keep track of. There is one pendulum and it's moving according to one angle. We are experts at pulling out those key features, those key patterns, and going from very high dimensional data to something low dimensional like angle theta and theta dot. So that's the kind of thing that a machine learning architecture would be chosen to do. I as a human know that this high dimensional data has low dimensional variables that matter, angle and angular velocity. So I might choose an architecture that does this compression, this kind of information bottleneck, this autoencoder uh, network that will take this high dimensional data and try to find two variables that best represents that data. This is a choice of architecture, and I'm implicitly assuming that the physical thing I'm modeling is low dimensional. Now, there will be a loss function in the next lecture that we need. We need a custom loss function for this autoencoder, so they go kind of hand in hand. But here is an example of an architecture we are using to promote low dimensionality. And moreover, I might want to actually get a differential equation out. I might want to learn some dynamics in that latent space, not just, you know, a compression to theta, theta dot, but I might want to learn the differential equation that governs the evolution of theta and theta dot, something like this, you know, uh, kind of F equals MA for, for a pendulum. 
And so I can learn those differential equations, again, by choosing a machine learning architecture that's good at learning differential equations. Something like this uh, Cindy sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. So again, this is not even a neural network. It's just, you know, I build a library of things that could be on the right-hand side, and I use some kind of an optimization to find the fewest of those library elements that add up to describe the dynamics. Okay, again, so that is an architecture. This is an architecture. It's a space of functions that could describe my observed data. And then there is some loss function and some optimization algorithm to find the best function in that search space, the best function uh, in that kind of space of, of uh, parameterized by this architecture. So these are two architectures that get to physics, okay? One of them, for example, is this compression. We're, we're assuming our physics is low dimensional. And here we're going to use um, this Cindy library procedure to get the differential equation. That's assuming our physics is kind of sparse or simple, that parsimonious idea. Okay, so this is just one example um, of, you know, an, a set of architectures that actually promotes physics. Um, this was codified by a really nice paper um, written by Kathleen Champion when she was a PhD student um, here at University of Washington with Nathan Kutz and myself, where essentially she did exactly that. She combined a deep neural network autoencoder to learn a good coordinate system uh, for the physics, a low dimensional coordinate system, and then also a Cindy model for how uh, the dynamics evolve in that low dimensional coordinate system. Okay, so this is a really um, nice way of promoting things we know should be true in physics, namely that they're parsimonious or simple, low dimensional uh, and sparse. And this is a theme we're gonna see over and over and over again. Even when we choose an architecture to be physical, we still often need custom loss functions to train these architectures, to find the best model in this space of functions parameterized by this architecture. So architectures usually have loss functions that are good uh, to train those architectures. Okay, good. Um, so I want to take a step back. What do I mean, again, by architecture? So there's lots and lots and lots of different types of architectures. There's, you know, hundreds or thousands of different types of neural networks. There's plenty of machine learning that are not neural networks, things like, you know, uh, generalized linear regression, support vector machines, Gaussian mixture models, k-means clustering, like there's a, a huge variety of machine learning models. At the end of the day, a machine learning model typically takes inputs, x, and tries to build some function that, predict, that predicts an output of interest y. And this function f that we're going to learn with, you know, for example, a neural network, um, so in the case of a neural network, you know, the input here would be x, the output would be y, and theta are all of the parameters that you can tweak, for example, the weights of the neural network, to tune or to fit this function to best fit y as a function of x. Okay, um, in the case of this Cindy uh, model procedure over here, you know, the, the outputs that we're trying to predict are the time derivatives of some system state, x dot. Um, the, you know, architecture that we're parameterizing is a bunch of, of polynomials in this case that you're trying to add up to equal x dot. And theta are the weights of those terms that, again, add up to approximate your dynamics. So, in all of our discussion about architectures, what we're really talking about is we're trying to constrain the space of functions f that we could use to describe this input-output mapping. Because, you know, if I, if I go to, you know, kind of a mathematical description, function spaces are usually really big. They're kind of infinite dimensional, very, very... Um, broad and inclusive, lots of functions live in these function spaces. Think of a Hilbert space, you know, uh, spanned by sines and cosines, like a Fourier basis. Um, what most machine learning architectures do is they constrain the space of possible functions that could describe this input-output relationship through a choice of architecture. So this is a very simple feed-forward neural network that has a little bit of an expansion and then a contraction. That's different than the autoencoder network we talked about before that had this really aggressive bottleneck. Uh, and that's different than a Cindy architecture that's entirely different than a neural network. 
But in all of these cases, your architecture is parameterized by some free parameters theta, and we're going to optimize those parameters using some loss function and some optimization algorithm to tune this function to fit data of the inputs and outputs, data that we actually observed and collected. Okay, so that's really, I want you thinking in the back of your mind, architectures, they look cool, everyone loves the pictures of, you know, UNETs and autoencoders and neural networks, they look really cool. But at the end of the day, what these are doing is these are parameterizing functions, and some parameterizations are more useful for some kinds of physics than others. Some of these function spaces allow me to enforce symmetries or enforce conservation laws or, um, you know, promote parsimony and simplicity, things like that. So um, I think that's everything I wanted to tell you here, but I want you thinking that these are um, architectures define a space of functions we're searching over, and we find the function we want by tuning these free parameters theta. Good. So now let's just go through some examples. Um, I've got maybe, I don't know, five or ten kind of my favorite examples of just architectures that are interesting. We're going to have whole videos on each of these architectures. You know, you can download code and examples. So this is just like the mile high thumbnail sketch. Um, this is one of my favorites. This is actually a really early example. Um, 2016, this is right when people were starting to apply machine learning to really solve hard problems in physics and engineering, um, where Julia Ling and her collaborators essentially built a deep neural network in panel B that can predict the Reynolds stresses that we need to, to build turbulence closure models. So when you're running like supercomputer simulations of fluid flow over a race car or um, you know a, a 787 wing or some kind of you know really big industrial fluid flow, usually we need some kind of a turbulence approximation because it's too expensive to simulate all of those fluid degrees of freedom. And so oftentimes we use something like this Reynolds average Navier-Stokes equation, but predicting these Reynolds stresses is really hard. That's been an open problem for five decades, how to, how to accurately um, predict these, actually more than five decades. And this paper uh, by Julia Ling and her collaborators uses a custom architecture in panel B that has this tensor input layer. And, you know, again, we're going to have a whole video talking about how this works. But essentially, through the choice of this architecture, through the choice of, of this function space that we can use to model these Reynolds stresses, they are able to make it so that these models, by construction, just because they're in this architecture, the models that are discovered have a property known as Galilean invariance, meaning the physics doesn't change in any inertial reference frame. So if I have a box of turbulence here, or I have a box of turbulence moving at a constant velocity, the physics, the, the closure model terms, the physics shouldn't change in any inertial frame. That's what it means to be Galilean invariant. And Ling et al. showed that through a choice of this architecture with this custom tensor layer enforces Galilean invariance by construction. All of the models represented in this function space are Galilean invariant. That's super powerful, and that's a way of building physics into the models. Presumably, you can train this with less data, and it will generalize better because it has that physics built into it. Really important idea, super cool paper. Um, other examples, um, the residual network. I mean, this is one of the most uh, powerful architectures in modern machine learning. Uh, this paper came out in 2015. I think by the time I made this video, it's been cited at least 50,000 times. People use it all the time. It is a particular uh, kind of deep architecture that has these jump or skip connections. And this architecture is designed approximately so that the function of um, this block behaves kind of like a numerical integrator, like an Euler integration scheme. Again, this is a choice of architecture that promotes something that we think might be physical, like time stepping forward. So this is really good for time series data and kind of you know, data that evolves in time, dynamical systems data. 
Um, the UNet architecture, again, this is a super powerful architecture for uh, super resolution, image segmentation. Um, it's the basis of, of a lot of diffusion models. And it has this inductive, implicit bias. The structure of this um, really speaks to the fact that the things that we observe in the real world are multi-scale. Okay, they're multi-scale in space. So if I am looking at, um, you know, a picture of the real world, it's going to have this multi-scale structure in time, uh, in space, and that's kind of implicitly built into this architecture. So this is good at parameterizing things like natural images um, or scenes, um, you know, of traffic or of a city or, you know, things like that. Um, Physics-informed neural networks, this is going to be one of the most important, uh, you know, little deep dives that we're going to do. I'm going to have a, a pretty substantial lecture series on this. And we're going to talk about it mostly in the context of the fourth stage of machine learning, crafting a loss function. But you'll notice, again, these are always kind of inherently mixed. Architectures and loss functions usually go together. Loss functions often rely on an architecture, and architectures often have custom loss functions you use to train those models. Pins are really, really interesting. Um, if you're trying to estimate something like, you know, a fluid velocity field, a spatial field, something, you know, like it has a U, a V, and a W component, maybe a pressure that varies in space and in time, what you can do is you can take a normal feedforward network that you would use to kind of predict those quantities. And then because of the automatic differentiability uh, of these neural network uh, environments like PyTorch and TensorFlow and JAX, you can often compute these partial derivatives of these quantities without having to like hard code it. And then you can add those outputs into a loss function that says that you actually have to satisfy the, the physics of the partial differential equation. So again, mostly this is a loss function, but it is relying on an architecture where you actually are using things in the neural network to get these quantities that you need for your loss function. So I think of it as kind of, you know, a little bit of architecture, mostly loss function. Um, Lagrangian neural networks and Hamiltonian neural networks are a really good example. Again, very much at this interface of architecture and loss function, where if you know your system conserves energy or has this kind of mechanical structure that we know, you know, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian systems have, you can often bake that in both into the architecture and into a loss function to train the neural network architecture. Okay, this is one of my favorite areas, uh, really, really cool work uh, in Lagrangian neural networks. Um, deep operator networks and operator networks in general, things like um, deep O-nets, Fourier neural operators, often use very custom architectures that accelerate the training uh, with less data. Okay, so again, lots of physical, implicit assumptions going into these uh, structures. We're gonna talk about this at length, um, a lot of these different operator networks. Um, Fourier neural operators is another really, really popular architecture. Again, the way I think about it, it's based on the fact that Every example we have of the real world, of physics in the real world, is multi-scale and typically very compactly and efficiently represented in the Fourier domain. So having these kind of Fourier layers in the Fourier neural operator is implicitly baking in some physics assumption about the multi-scale nature of physics. Uh, and again, we'll have a whole you know, video talking about this later. Um, graph neural networks are a super cool example. Some of the neatest, um, results in machine learning for physical systems are related to graph neural networks. Things like, you know, discovering um, laws of planetary motion that generalize to multi-planet systems, simulating fluid flows. Um, GNNs are, you know, all about baking in some assumption of the structure of how things interact, like n-body systems or molecular dynamics or, you know, rigid body systems a lot of opportunities to bake physics uh, into the, these graph neural networks. This is something I've been wanting to learn a lot more about myself, so I think we're actually gonna learn about this together. Um, I'm using this as an excuse to kind of dig into this topic. And really um, some very powerful demonstrations of you know, efficient 
accurate machine learning models to really simulate some pretty complicated physics. Um, this is a super neat paper where they show that they can simulate lots of different types of fluids and elastics and just complicated partial differential equations using relatively simple ideas in, in graph neural networks to, to kind of bake in some of the physics of that system. And I think roughly speaking, it relies on the idea that the physics of one little parcel is probably similar to the physics of another little parcel. So instead of a huge neural network that takes in the entire, you know, voxel movie, maybe there is a much smaller set of rules that determines locally what the physics interactions are. Okay, so again, we'll dive into this a lot more. Um, good. That was uh, kind of the big overview. That's, uh, I would say, about half of the topics we're going to talk about, um, you know, at length in detail throughout the rest of the five or ten or fifteen hours of material in physics and form machine learning. Um, something that I really, really want to convey, um, and so I'm going to talk about it here, is this notion that symmetries are fundamentally important to physics, and they're fundamentally important to how we encode physics into machine learning and discover physics with machine learning. So symmetries and invariants are one of the most useful mathematical notions that we can use to improve machine learning for physical systems. We're going to, again, this is going to be like a five hour minimum deep dive into what symmetries are, how to enforce them with machine learning, how to learn them with machine learning. Here I'm just going to give you the tiniest preview of what I mean by symmetries and invariants. Um, and this is a huge area of research where people are working super hard to bake these ideas into machine learning. So invariance means the following thing. So let's say I have some machine learning architecture, uh, maybe it's a neural network, that takes in an image of a dog or a cat, and it spits out through this, uh, this function f you know, is my neural network, and the output, it tells me if it's a dog or a cat. Okay, so an image of a dog goes in, I get a label dog or cat out. Super simple you know, neural network, you can train this easily yourself. Invariance means that we know that the notion of a dog shouldn't matter if that dog is translated in the image or rotated or scaled. So there are some transformations. Typically, this is quantified by something called a symmetry group or a Lie group. Uh, there are some transformations G that if I transform my data through G and then I run that through my neural network, I should get the same output. This is still a dog even though it's rotated by 30 degrees. Okay, so that's what we, we mean by invariance. We want our model F to be invariant to these transformations G that we think the physics is invariant to. The physics of what it means to be a dog doesn't change if I rotate that dog. So invariance means that my output doesn't change even if I run it through those transformations, those rotations, translations, things like that. Okay, we understand this intuitively. That's kind of what the word invariant means. Okay, there is another notion in machine learning, it's really in mathematics, called equivariance, and it is subtly different than invariance. These are really important, both are important. Equivariance means that if I take my data and I transform it through some symmetry, like a rotation, some symmetry operation, and then I run both of those through my neural network, then the output of my neural network is also run through uh, that rotation or translation. So it's a little different. Um, here we were talking about you know, classification where the output should be identical. Here, maybe I'm building a neural network that does image segmentation. Maybe it takes this picture of a dog and it segments it into you know, paws and snout and it kind of you know, labels what the, the bottom of the dog is and the top of the dog is. That's the output Y. And so equivariance means if I take my input and I rotate it or translate it, if I transform it, and then I run both of those copies through my, my machine learning architecture, the output should be, you know, also have that same rotation or translation. Mathematically, what we mean, uh, what we say is that the function f, our kind of machine learning model, and this symmetry operation g commute. I can do g then f, or f then g, and I get the same 
answer. That, that mathematically, this is called a commutative diagram. And there's a ton of, uh, of algebra, of group theory, um, Lie group theory, that tells us when a function f and a symmetry group g commute, and how, and things like that. And so this is a really big idea. We know that convolutional neural networks promote this idea of you know, translation invariance. It's now possible, there are some really good research papers out there showing us how to build in general symmetry groups into things like autoencoders uh, and other neural network architectures. So we can start building our machine learning models to satisfy these symmetries, these rotation and translation invariances by construction. And the upshot here is, if I had to learn this by just augmenting my data, I would need a lot more data of rotated, translated copies of my data. But if I can build my architecture to have this equivariance property by construction, because I know from physics that there's a symmetry, I can dramatically reduce the amount of data I need to train that model, and it's gonna generalize way, way, way better. So there's excellent work by, um, Max Welling, by Tess Schmidt, by many others out there in the community talking about equivariance in machine learning models. And so we're gonna have a big section talking about how do you build these equivariant models, um, you know, what kind of loss functions do you use, what kind of architectures, how much more efficient are they, how much better do they generalize. But I just couldn't give this lecture on architectures without letting you know that you know, equivariance is one of the most important ways we promote physicality uh, through architectural choices. Okay, good. Um, so that is the kind of mile high lecture on stage three of machine learning, designing an architecture and opportunities for building in physics into that, uh, into that stage. So next we're gonna talk about loss functions and optimization, again, closely related. These are all kind of coupled. Uh, and then we're gonna dive into tons of cool examples and you know, if there's an architecture you wanna know about, hopefully we are going to cover it. All right, thank you.